The subject of today's session is the period of the Exodus. In particular, two verses that God says to Moses in the lead up to the Exodus. But most importantly, beyond what these verses signify, the crucial transformation that is the Exodus. Before we get to these two verses, we need to recall the background. We've discussed this background in the past, but let's see what the words of the Bible are that prepare us for this crucial transformation. What takes place in Exodus chapter 5 is the sorry consequence of Moses' initial appearance before Pharaoh when, as you undoubtedly recall, not only did matters not get better, they got much, much worse. The straw that was a crucial ingredient in the bricks that the people of Israel were expected to deliver is no longer provided. They need to go and gather a stubble for straw and the tally of the bricks remains unchanged. And so in Exodus chapter five, we read of the entreaties of the officers of the people of Israel to Pharaoh to get some kind of reprieve, entreaties that are flatly denied. And when they are on their way out from this hopeless attempt to reduce the burden on Israel, they encounter Moses and Aaron, who are, in some sense, on their way in. In some sense, I say, because Moses and Aaron are standing in the way and they say to Moses and Aaron in chapter 5, verse 21, may God look upon you and judge. Look what you've done. Because you have made our savers to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Again, everything has gotten worse. You're responsible. And after this complaint, Moses returns to God. And in a state of what we can only describe as total demoralization, he comes to God with two specific complaints. Complaint number one, at the beginning of verse 22, God, why have you dealt ill with his people? What are you doing to them? Instead of any kind of relief, things are only getting worse and worse. And complaint number two, the last part of verse 22, why did you send me on a personal plane? My mission has thus far been a complete, utter, absolute failure. Why did you send me? And elaborating on both of these complaints, with respect to the second complaint, why did you send me? I thought that if I would be sent, at least if things weren't going to immediately become better, they wouldn't become worse. But since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt ill with his people. You've made it worse. And as for the first complaint, why have you dealt so badly with his people? At the end of verse 23, you haven't delivered your people at all because they're your people. They're not just this people. At the very least, by dint of the mission upon which you sent me, they're your people. What are you doing? Now, these two complaints certainly demand a response, uttered in sincerity, not because of some egotistical desire for 
being complimented for self-adulation, but because of the pain of a sincere, honest leader. And so God responds. Inevitably, God responds with respect to both complaints. First complaint, why have you dealt ill with this people? In the next verse, which depending upon the addition of the Bible is either the last verse of chapter five or the first verse of chapter six. God said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. For by a strong hand shall he let them go and by a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. You'll see what happens next. So at the very least on that plane, there is something of a response to the complaint. Again, why have you dealt ill with his people? But remember, there still is the additional complaint, if you will, the personal complaint about the mission. Why do you send me? And the next two verses, it would appear, are God's response to that complaint. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, the translation reads, I am the Lord. I need to quibble a bit about the translation here. The convention in the translation that we're using is to render the tetragrammaton in most instances as Lord and to write Lord in capital letters. I personally prefer to translate God's holy name, the four letter name, the Tetragrammaton, as God, because Lord sounds to me more like a title. And as we will yet have occasion to discuss, the salient feature of God's holy name, the Tetragrammaton, is it's not a title. It is a name of all of the ways we refer to God. All the rest are descriptions. This is a proper noun. This is God's name. We'll return to this point a bit later. But for now, to appreciate what is articulated in these verses of God's response, I am God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, Comparison. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob as God Almighty, which is the translation here of El Shaddai. We'll be discussing these names a little bit later. But by my name, again, it's rendered here as the Lord, God the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. I made me not known to them. Something is changing now. And that's something, it clearly emerges here, has implications with respect to your mission. Because your mission here includes, verse six, wherefore say unto the people of Israel, I am the Lord, God, the Tetragrammaton. The holy name. And after in the continuation, we read of the divine plan for the Exodus. The promise of deliverance from bondage and God taking Israel as his people. The emphasis, again, in verse 7 is, you will know that I am the Lord, God, the holy name, your God. And finally, in culmination, in verse 8, I will bring you unto the land concerning which I lifted up my hand to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage. Again, I am am the Lord, God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton.
So clearly what is described in these verses is something different, a crucial transformation. Indeed, the uniqueness of Moses' mission. But of course, very clearly as well, we don't have a clue what it's actually telling us yet. Now, returning to the initial comparison that we saw expressed in this edition in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. In other Bibles, it may be verses 1 and 2, but it's just a matter of the numbers. There's a comparison between what is revealed here to Moses, the holy name of God, and what was revealed to our holy forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God Almighty. Now, indeed, when we consider what we read in the lives of the patriarchs, we do repeatedly encounter these names. In the Hebrew, again, El Shaddai, God Almighty. Consider in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, God reveals himself to Abraham, and the way he reveals himself to Abraham is, I am God Almighty. In the Hebrew, El Shaddai. With precisely the same names, the same combination, God reveals himself to Jacob when Jacob returns to the land of Israel. We read in Genesis chapter 35, in verse 11, God said unto him, I am God Almighty. In the Hebrew again, El Shaddai. And moreover, these names appear not only in the context of what God reveals to them, but also what they say. In Genesis chapter 28, in verse 3, as Isaac is sending Jacob on his journey to his uncle, Laban, to seek a wife, he blesses Jacob, and God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be a congregation of peoples. Again, God Almighty, El Shaddai. And likewise, Jacob also employs these names. First, in Genesis chapter 43, when he is reluctantly sending his sons back to the mysterious ruler of Egypt, together with Benjamin, Jacob, filled with trepidation, blesses them in verse 14, and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release unto you your other brother and Benjamin. God Almighty, El Shaddai. And approximately 17 years later, Jacob, on his deathbed, in recounting the events of his life in Genesis chapter 48, verse 3, again invokes these names. Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan. God Almighty, El Shaddai. And although these names don't appear adjacent to one another, they do both appear in the following chapter, in chapter 49, in Jacob's blessing to Joseph. In verse 25, even by the God of your father who shall help you and by the Almighty who shall bless you, respectively, El Shaddai, God Almighty. So clearly, our Holy Fathers were well acquainted with these names. In continuing this overview, I feel it would only be appropriate for me to continue and give you an exhaustive survey of everywhere where these names, the name Shaddai, rendered here as Almighty, these names appear 
in, Je in the five books of Moses. Where does Moses, for example, use these names? I would give you an exhaustive survey, except we already completed the exhaustive survey. Moses never uses these names. Indeed, apropos of that comparison, that God gives Moses between him and the patriarchs. In the rest of the five books of Moses, we encounter El Shaddai, God Almighty, only two more times, and it's not Moses who uses them. The appearances are both in Numbers chapter 24. The context is when Bil'am introduces what he had intended to be curses of Israel and were in fact blessings. In Numbers chapter 24, in verse 4, the saying of him who hears the words of God, El, who sees the vision of the Almighty, Shaddai. And similarly, in verse 16, in almost the same words, the saying of him who hears the words of God, El, and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, Shaddai. Again, it's important for us to appreciate beyond Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is the only passage in which we encounter these names. That is, in the career of Moses, they only appear by way of exclusion. This is not the way I am making myself known to you with the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. So at this point, it seems almost natural to conclude that what is meant in, again, our chapter, Exodus chapter 6, the comparison between Moses and the patriarchs is that Moses knows the name. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, speaking of God as God Almighty, maybe didn't at all. We might indeed reach that conclusion, but if we were to reach that conclusion, we must admit it would be flat out wrong. And that becomes clear when we again return to Genesis and consider what else we read about our holy fathers and mothers. Remember that in Genesis chapter 17, God reveals himself to Abraham as God Almighty. Well, in Genesis chapter 15, in verse 7, we read explicitly that God says to Abraham, I am the Lord God, using the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. Clearly it was revealed. In Genesis chapter 12, even earlier on, we get an intimation that Abraham is already dedicating himself to spreading the word, spreading the name of God using the Tetragrammaton. It is indeed with the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name, that we read in chapter 12, in verse 7, God appears to Abraham. Abraham builds an altar in verse 7, and again in verse 8. And in particular, we read in verse 8, Abraham called in the name of God. Called in the name of God. An interesting expression. What does it mean? There are a number of different points of view, but the one that I think is most relevant for our circumstances is called in the name of God is a reflection of Abraham's mission. He was going about teaching people about God. Calling in his name means proclaiming the message of God's divinity. Calling in the name of God is most directly and literally calling by the name, the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. This becomes a major feature in the mission of Abraham, likewise in the career of Isaac, we 
encounter in Genesis chapter 13, again in verse 4, Abraham calling in the name of God, the Tetragrammaton. In verse 18, again, there is the building of an altar unto God, again, the Tetragrammaton. In Genesis chapter 21, where Abraham's strategy of broadcasting God's name through acts of kindness is explicitly articulated. We read in verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. The Hebrew for tamarisk tree may also be an acronym for providing lodging, food, drink, either lodging or escort. Abraham bestowing kindness upon wayfarers, and he called there in the name of God. In the name of God, again, the Tetragrammaton. True, in this verse, we also encounter the other name, El, which is rendered here as God, but the core, the key message, Abraham is calling in the name of God by his holy name, the Tetragrammaton. Clearly, he knew it. This becomes perhaps most stridently manifest in Genesis chapter 22, when we read of the binding of Isaac, and in particular, in the aftermath of the binding of Isaac, in chapter 22, verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, God, the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, will see, using God's holy name. God will see. As it is said to this day, in the mount where God will be seen. Again, using the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. Now, this is explicitly the name, the name given to the place, and it incorporates God's holy name, the Tetragrammaton. I feel compelled at least in passing, to note where is this place? Of course, at the beginning of the passage, we read that God's summons of Abraham is in verse 2, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, even Isaac, and get you unto the land of Moriah and offer him there for burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. So, of course, we know this mountain was in the land of Moriah. Where is the land of Moriah? Well, once again, it would be nice to do an exhaustive survey of every place in the Bible where Moriah appears. So let's do that. There's only one other place. And that, of course, is in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 3, verse 1, where we read, Then Solomon began to build the house of God at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. So we know this is the Temple Mount. And the Temple Mount is dubbed by Abraham with this name, God will see, which, as we've discussed elsewhere, constitutes one portion of the name of Jerusalem. But again, for our purposes, it's using the Tetragrammaton. To be even-handed, we consider not only our Holy Fathers, but also our Holy Mothers. In Genesis chapter 16, admittedly, the context is not very happy, but we read in verse 2, Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, God, the Lord, using the Tetragrammaton, has restrained me from bearing. Come in, I pray you, unto my handmaid. Marry my handmaid, Hagar, that... I shall be built up through her. But the way she refers to God is with the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. And after Hagar immediately conceives and is contemptuous of Sarai as a result, the way Sarai expresses her complaint to Abraham is likewise. May 
God judge between me and you, where God's name once again is the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. This in the lives of our first Holy Father and Holy Mother, Abraham and Sarah. We continue with the next generation. And in the case of Isaac, in Genesis chapter 26, in verse 22, we read that Isaac digs a well upon which there is no strife. And he called the name of it Rechavot. And he said, for now, God has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. And once again, God appears as the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. And in continuing the same theme we saw repeatedly in the case of Abraham. In verse 25, he built an altar there and called in the name of God, called in the name of God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. So clearly, again, Isaac is using it. He uses it, moreover, in specifically speaking to the next generation, the way he begins his blessing, his blessing that admittedly was intended for Esau, but was given to Jacob in chapter 27, in verse 27 is, see the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which God has blessed. God, the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. And once again, to maintain our even-handedness, not only Isaac, but also Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca pray to God because of her barrenness and God appears there as the holy name. And after Rebecca conceives and she has an especially difficult pregnancy, she went to inquire of God, of God, once again, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. Continuing with the third generation of our holy fathers and mothers, in Genesis chapter 28, when Jacob experiences his first explicit divine revelation, how does God reveal himself? We noted that in Genesis chapter 35, God reveals himself to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But in chapter 28, the first revelation is, I am God. I am God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, but first the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. And Jacob gets the message. In verse 16, surely God is in this place using God's holy name. And Jacob makes a vow to God. And the conclusion of the vow is that when I come back to my father's house in peace, then shall God, the Tetragrammaton, the holy name, be my God. Finally, with respect to Jacob, we'll note an additional example. We've already seen that Jacob employed El Shaddai in his final blessing to his sons, in particular in the blessing to Joseph. Well, he also employs the Tetragrammaton in his blessing to his sons. That is, again, in Genesis chapter 49, in verse 18, in the blessing for Dan, I wait for your salvation, O Lord, O God. Again, using God's holy name, the Tetragrammaton. And with our third and fourth holy mothers, when we consider Leah and Rachel, first note that Leah invokes the holy name the Tetragrammaton, in naming three of her first four children. In Genesis chapter 29, verse 32, with respect to Reuben, in verse 33, 
with respect to Simeon, and in verse 35, with respect to Judah. And likewise, Rachel. In Genesis chapter 30, the circumstances inevitably are at least partly tragic, that Rachel also invokes the holy name of God when she finally has a child. In verse 24, she called his name Joseph, saying, may God add to me another son. God is written again as the holy name, as the Tetragrammaton. So, returning then to our chapter, to Exodus chapter 6, clearly we're not going to be able to understand the comparison between the patriarchs and Moses if we think the comparison means that Moses learns about the name and the patriarchs never heard of it. They knew the name, they used the name. There wasn't any mystery here in that vein. Maybe it's important for us before we continue to just clarify what we mean by this holy name. Because there is, if you will, a certain degree of mystique that we associate with this name because of its holiness, but that doesn't mean that it was unknown. I do feel compelled to stress that as a standard course, we do not write out God's holy name because of its sanctity, except in the holy books, which is why you will find throughout this source sheet and indeed all of our source sheets that the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, is written as an abbreviation, the letter Hey, followed by an apostrophe. We furthermore never pronounce it at all. We never pronounce it, first of all, because we don't know the pronunciation. As undoubtedly all of the Hebrew speakers and readers are well aware, in Hebrew, generally speaking, only the consonants are written. The vowels are the points that appear either above or below the letter itself. In the case of the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name, we don't know what the vowels are. So we don't know how to pronounce these consonants, since inevitably, without the vowels, there's no clear pronunciation. Undoubtedly, our having lost the tradition with respect to the correct pronunciation is also a reflection of the fact that the holy name was hardly ever used, indeed only used by the priests inside the holy temple. The priests would bless the people, the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6, using God's holy name, the Tetragrammaton. The high priest would use the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, in the service on Yom Kippur, about which we read in Leviticus chapter 16. But indeed, due to its holiness, it isn't used in a mundane manner at all. Nowadays, again, we don't know how to pronounce it, but we'll still reiterate, clearly the patriarchs were familiar with the name. So if they were, aren't we back where we started? What is God saying to Moses? What kind of justification of the mission is there in stating, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, God, the Lord, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, I made me not known to them, when in fact, he did. They knew the name. What's going on? Inevitably, what we need to consider and what makes the transformation that takes place at the time of the Exodus so significant is 
We're not just talking about names. We're talking about modalities, how God is manifest in the world, how we interact with him. Because, you know, a name is not the essence of that which bears the name, but the name is the way you recognize the one who bears the name. And so when we consider the comparison between the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, and El Shaddai, God Almighty, we are intimating a comparison of modalities through which God is revealed. In order to understand what that means, well, we're going to have to consider just what these names actually signify. So let's begin with that name El, the first of the two in the pair of names associated with the patriarchs. We've noted in the past that El is not specifically a holy name. Indeed, as a good example, in Genesis chapter 31, when Laban is in hot pursuit of Jacob and catches up with him, he tells him ominously in verse 29, after having challenged him, what have you done? It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. I can't because your God told me not to. But it is in the power of my hand. Now, how does he refer to the power of his hand? In the Hebrew, in the power of is le'el. El means power. And indeed, el, as a mundane word, divorced from divine implications, refers generally to any source of power. How does it become a name of God? This is an important observation for us to make. There's a process that we can describe as extrapolation. We observe in this world various sources of power, sources of power of various levels and in various contexts. We extrapolate from them to a supreme, transcendent, source of power. That is El in the sense of a name of God. But El has many other senses. In essence, it is not a name of God. It is a description of God as a source of power, derivative of the sources of power that we encounter in this world. That's the case with El. Let's consider, in a similar vein, the meaning of Shaddai. So we already noted that Shaddai is rendered in our translation as almighty. But what essentially does it signify? To ask the question etymologically, what is the derivation of this name Shaddai? Now I must concede in this regard that there are a number of different answers proposed among the scholars in analyzing the name Shaddai, but perhaps the most compelling thesis is that Shaddai, ironically, comes from the Hebrew root Shaddad. What does Shaddad mean? I grant this may sound awfully strange, even shocking. Shaddad means to spoil. To plunder. In Isaiah chapter 15, verse 1, we read the prophecy of retribution with respect to Moab. For in the night that Ar of Moab is spoiled, spoiled, Shudad, same root. In the night that Kir of Moab is spoiled, and again, Shudad. And we encounter this root repeatedly in other contexts as well. In 
Psalm 91, in verse 6, you will not fear of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that spoils at noonday. Spoils, again, the same root in the Hebrew, yashud. And in a turn of phrase that we find in both Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6, and in Joel chapter 1, verse 15, the prophets speak of the awesome day of God as a day of spoiling from the Almighty. In Hebrew, it's an alliteration because both words come from the same root. Keshod Mishadai. Again, Shod signifying plundering, Shaddai being the name, the Almighty. Now, in much the same vein as we saw with respect to El, besides the usage of the name as referring to God, there's also a mundane usage. That may be the case with respect to Shaddai as well. Well, again, there are different views among the commentators. But in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 24, when Ezekiel describes his awesome vision, when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters. And then the next words in the Hebrew, Kikol Shaddai, which could be rendered in English as like the voice of the Almighty, or alternatively, if Shaddai then carries the connotation of spoiling, plundering, overpowering. Kikol Shaddai could simply mean a mighty noise. And indeed, that's precisely the point to appreciate with respect to this name as well. When we render Shaddai as almighty, it is a reflection of what essentially Shaddai signifies as the one who plunders, the one who spoils. Now, why should we use such a verb that has such a negative connotation in referring to God? But then it's important for us to appreciate what it signifies when we use it in referring to God. We're describing the manner in which we perceive God manifest in the world. God as the one who, having authored the system, manipulates it plunders it, spoils the system. What system? The system, in a word, of nature. Nature, obviously, from our perspective, is not something that is in business for itself. It's not autonomous. It is, after all, created by God. But once God creates nature, he does for the most part, allow it to function as a system. And that means it will appear to function on autopilot, autonomously, impersonally. A system that, left alone, doesn't countenance any individual virtue or vice, does not bestow any reward or punishment, a system. Except, remember, it's never truly on its own. It's created by God. God continues to control that system. And God manipulates that system in bestowing reward and punishment, in countenancing the virtues and vices of the individuals that make them worthy of that reward and punishment. Nature is a tool, an implement in God's hands. But as a tool in God's hands, 
God despoils it. God plunges it. God manipulates it. It's all, ultimately, in God's control. What's important for us to appreciate here, and this is critical when we come to consider the transformation that takes place at the Exodus, is manipulating the system, even spoiling, plundering the system, presumes there's still a system. Nature continues to exist. Again, not on its own, but as a tool in God's hands, a tool that is real and that is manipulated by God in bringing about his will. So, for example, in this regard, when we consider what we read in Psalm 91, now Psalm 91 explicitly speaks of this last name that we just discussed, Shaddai. In verse 1, you who dwells in the covert of the Most High and abides in the shadow of the Almighty, the shadow of the Almighty, the Tzel Shaddai. What happens when you abide in the shadow of the Almighty? So we read, for example, in verses 3 and 4, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings shall you take refuge. His truth is a shield and a buckler. And inevitably, we can't help but note, if you're covered by his pinions, if you take refuge under his wings, obviously, there's something out there from which you need to be shielded. Something out there for which you need a refuge. His truth is a shield and a buckler because you need to be shielded. Again, the system is real. The system continues to exist. But God manipulates the system as, as it were the plunder, the spoiler, the one who protects. This indeed becomes the salient feature in the lives of the patriarchs. We read in the first book of Chronicles in chapter 16, and I'll note that this poem appears in almost the same words in Psalm 105 as well. We read of the manner in which God oversees the lives of the patriarchs. From verse 16, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And he established it unto Jacob for a statute to Israel for an everlasting covenant. And what was this covenant? So it included the promise of the land, the lot of your inheritance. But moreover, what it also included is from verse 20. When they went about from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, for their sake he reproved kings. Touch not my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. No. Touch not minorated ones, obviously indicates they could have. Just God protected them. Do my prophets no harm? They might otherwise have done harm, but God protected them. That is, the people out there, the men who might otherwise have done them wrong, the kings who needed to be reproved, are still there. The system continues to exist. And it is in that context that we need to understand what these names that are manifest in the lives and times of the patriarchs signify. We refer to God as El Shaddai. Number one, the names themselves are essentially descriptions that are borrowed from the context of life in this world. 
They are not names per se that refer distinctly to God. Borrowed from the circumstances in this world, El meaning power, Shadad, spoiling or plundering. We apply these descriptions to God as the transcendent source of power, as the ultimate spoiler, with the realization that again, the exercise in which we are engaging is one of extrapolation. We take what we encounter in this world and we trace it until we get to God. But inevitably, that means that the conception of God that results is one that is linked to this world. As of course it is when we consider that these modalities through which God is manifest are modalities of God manipulating the system, being the source of power within the system. Everything is within the system. God operating within this world. That is the modality that pertained to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Indeed, that is the modality that pertained altogether in the world before this crucial transformative moment. That moment at which we, we read that while I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob as God Almighty, and by my name, Lord, God, I made me not known to them, to you, Moses, I am saying, I am God, the Tetragrammaton, the holy name. And of course, inevitably at this point, what is most crucial is for us to consider what does that holy name signify? In order to answer this question, I need to share with you a bit of nomenclature and etymology. The nomenclature is not in the Bible. The etymology is. In early post-biblical literature, this name, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, is identified in the Hebrew as Shem HaMeforash. And of course, inevitably, we need to translate what does Shem HaMeforash mean? As the Hebraic scholars undoubtedly recognize, Shem means name. The name that is Meforash, meaning, what is Meforash? It is a term that appears, admittedly, only rarely in the Bible, in a sense that is relevant with respect to this expression. But I'd like to, in particular, call our attention to three individual cases. They may be the only cases in which we find this word in a similar kind of conjugation and sense being employed. The first two instances in Leviticus chapter 24 and Numbers chapter 15 pertain to specificity, something being clarified. In particular, the two narratives here are actually very similar. Someone commits a capital crime, and in as much as the assembly does not yet know how the punishment is to be meted out, the criminal is put in ward under guard that it might be specified unto them what should be done. That's the way we read it in. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 12, and similarly in Numbers chapter 15, verse 34. The specificity, the clarification that indeed in the Hebrew, in Leviticus is Rifosh, in Numbers, Forash, both declinations of the same root 
that informs that post-biblical expression, Shem HaMeforash, as referring to God's holy name. And the only place in which we actually encounter Meforash in precisely this conjugation, similarly, is in Nehemiah, in chapter 8, verse 8, after reading that Ezra here opened up the book of the Torah in the sight of all the people, we are told in verse 8, they read in the book of the Torah of God distinctly, distinctly, Mifarash. So, Mifarash then indeed carries this connotation of something that is explicit, something definitive, something specified, something clear. It might seem ironic that usually the Hebrew Shem HaMeforash is translated into English as God's ineffable name. Ineffable, that which cannot be articulated, which cannot be described. In order to understand what we mean by referring to God's holy name in this manner, Besides the three examples that we just noted from Leviticus, Numbers, and Nehemiah, there is an additional instance in which the same root appears. And I realize this might sound a bit technical, but I think the benefits of the effort make it worthwhile. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 12, we read, as a shepherd, seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are separated. The sheep have scattered. They are separated. And God's promise, so will I seek out my sheep. But we're not concerned so much with the theme here as we are with the language, the etymology. The Hebrew for that are separated is nifrashot. Nifrashot, separated, comes from the self-same root as Meforash, which raises, we cannot help but note, an obvious problem. Meforash, clarified, specified, made explicit on the one hand. But on the other hand, as we already noted, Meforash, ineffable, separated, removed, remote inaccessible. Now, at first brush, it would appear that these two themes are diametric opposites. How can they both be associated with the same word? And here's where we need to really consider deeply what the significance of this name is. And on a deeper plane to consider what Meforash means. Because while these two definitions, one, explicit, specified, clarified, on the one hand, and distant, remote, separated, on the other hand, may seem to be diametric opposites. They're actually two sides of the same coin. Consider as a simple example. I have an apple and I'd like to explain to you what an apple is. So I tried to give you a definition where inevitably the tension in my giving you this definition is, if I tell you things about an apple that are totally remote, unknown to you, it would be the same as my giving you a definition in a foreign language in which you don't understand a single word. So in order to explain to you what an apple is, I start out 
by telling you that an apple is a fruit. So you know about various types of fruit, and now you understand that an apple is part of that category of fruit. But of course, that hasn't told you exactly what an apple is. So I add the observation that the apple is red. Now, you've encountered the color red before, and so in your mind, you have a category of red objects, and now you appreciate that apples are also part of that category. We're not finished yet. I now tell you that the apple is round. So you have various categories of shapes in your mind, and now you know that the apple is to be put into the category of objects that are round. Well, at this point, you've heard that apples are red, round fruits. Of course, I'm not finished yet, but appreciate that this is a process that can lead to a clear definition. How? Because if you have all these categories already in your mind, you know what fruit are, you know what red is, you know what round is, then if you consider all of these categories drawn, let's say, on a piece of paper, there will be an overlap between all these different categories. Apples are in that overlap. And if I come up with additional aspects of being an apple that further clarify to you what the apple is, we'll get to a point where the only thing in the overlap among all of these different categories that include apple, the only object that is common to every one of these categories is apple. At that point, you have a definition. Now, what has that definition done? It has, on the one hand, made distinct, made specific, made clarified, then all those things that make the apple explicit to you. And in what manner have these various categories made the apple clearly defined to you? By setting it apart by making it completely distinct from everything else. So now you know what an apple is. Appreciate that this approach to defining apple can be applied to every single thing in this world. Every single thing in this world can similarly be clarified. Clarified, specified, by being set apart. But of course, in order to be able to get to that, that clarity, to force, it must be something in this world so that whatever categories you use to explain what it is that you are defining are categories from this world that you've already experienced and so that are already clarified to you. It should be clear that this doesn't apply to God. God is not of this world. There is no way that we can establish categories of this world that will include God. And so God remains beyond any of the categories. Shem HaMeforash, which again will translate as God's ineffable name, signifies God as He is. As He is and nothing else is. God completely beyond description because there is nothing in this world that can possibly be used as a basis for comparison at all.
Consider then that when we refer to God by his holy name, number one, it's not going to be an extrapolation from something in this world. It's not going to be the mental exercise of, I see something in this world and trace the line to God. That works with every other word, doesn't work with God's holy name. Everything else, again, as we noted, is a description. The holy name alone is a name. It refers only to God, and indeed is God's name. And what likewise it signifies, apropos of what we said about El Shaddai, is it's not an extrapolation. It's not something that is embedded in this world. It's not something that can even be accessed through this world. The only way you can truly encounter God's holy name is when it is revealed in prophecy. Now, that doesn't mean that it's completely off limit to any nonprofit, because while we aren't prophets ourselves, we learn from the prophets. We read their words. We encounter prophecy vicariously through the words of the Bible. But it's important for us to stress that this holy name indeed signifies a resolute break with everything that came before. And this is an idea that we can identify first as expressed in Exodus chapter 3, three chapters ago. Recall that in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, Moses asks God a question. At first brush, it seemed like a very strange question. Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? What does it mean? What I call you? Is it just a matter of a name? Ah, uh, but again, a question of modality. But they are in essence asking is, how are we supposed to grapple with, deal with this mission upon which God is sending you? Are we to associate God with anything else in our previous experiences? Are we to associate God with some this worldly description. And in much the same vein as we encounter the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, in Exodus chapter 6, God's response in verse 14 is, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall you say unto the people of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. You know, we should note, I am, in Hebrew, Ehye, is unquestionably related etymologically to the Tetragrammaton, same root. And what, in essence, is God telling Moses, I am that I am? I'm defined in terms of myself, not in terms of anything in this world. Any attempt to grasp God within the context of this world will lead either to a debasement or, if not, to an extrapolation, to describing God as an extrapolation from this world, from plundering to the supreme plunderer, from forces of power to the supreme source of power. I am that I am. What Moses is asking, based upon his understanding of his heritage and of 
the threshold upon which he is standing, where the modality of God's revelation in the world is poised to change, is, is this going to be part of the modality that we already know from before? Says God, no. Remember El Shaddai, manipulating, plundering the system, but there was a system to plunder. That's relating to God as manifest in nature. But then there's another modality, which is the complete negation of the system itself, where there is no system. And where we perceive God not within the context of something preexistent, but on the contrary, we perceive God exclusively in terms of himself. That is I am that I am. That is, again, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, God, the holy name, the name that is completely remote from anything in this world. But that name I made me not known to them, and I'm making it known to you. That's precisely the transformation that's taking place in the Exodus, the transformation that takes place here. On what basis? In what context? As expressed in Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of God, and that indeed is the Tetragrammaton, the holy name, were the heavens made. So first of all, recognize that when we speak of God's holy name, we speak of God as creator. As creator, ex nihilo, from nothing. Meaning, there is no context. There is no background. When we speak of God as God Almighty, there's a context, there's a background. Whatever God is doing is part of a continuity that pertains to what existed before. Creation is not part of a continuity. Creation is the ultimate discontinuity. God revealed on a level that goes entirely beyond anything in this world. That's what happens at creation, but not only at creation. We also encounter God's holy name, the Tetragrammaton, at the beginning of the Decalogue. Exodus chapter 20. I am God, Tetragrammaton, your God, your Lord, who brought you forth from the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Now, of course, inevitably, there are two dimensions here. One is who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. The Exodus itself, the Exodus is a set of miracles, a set of wonders that is not going to be continuous with anything that came before. The ultimate this continuity, this is not like the manner in which God saves the patriarchs from the intrusions of the system. This is God completely transcending the system. And moreover, it's not just about the exodus. Revelation. Revelation is not perceiving God in the system, in nature. Nature will never countenance the idea of God being explicitly revealed. That's not part of a system. That's not part of a continuity. In some sense, the Exodus, the revelation, are like reprisals of creation itself. A completely new beginning and that's crucial here because that is the nature of the transformation the transformation is something new something that never existed in the world before and so first of all to conclude when we recall the context of god introducing his holy name at the beginning of Exodus chapter 6, remember, it was a response to a complaint. Moses' complaint 
in this vein was, why did you send me? Since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt ill with his people. I would expect at the very least that if you send me on a mission, when I come, things should get better. If not better, at least they shouldn't get worse. But everything's gotten worse, says God. If indeed the mission upon which I were sending you were a mission that were consonant with God Almighty, that is, God manipulating the system, plundering the system, spoiling the system, but there's a system, then in some natural sense, you would indeed be justified in expecting that naturally things will get better. Some ordinary continuous course of improvement because of your mission. That is not your mission. Your mission is going to derive from I am God, the holy name. The name associated with creation, the name associated with revelation, the name that is essentially totally discontinuous with anything that came before. And therefore, don't try to judge your mission based upon what you anticipate as a natural course of events. Things really are going to be getting worse, much worse, until there's a miracle, a set of miracles, a string of plagues, something that completely subverts the system, not part of the system at all. That negation of the system is the salient feature of your mission, Moses. And of course, in retrospect, that obviously is the case. As Moses realizes and expresses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, where he expresses it precisely in these terms, in verse 32, Ask now of the days past which were before you, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and from one end of heaven unto the other, whether there has been any such thing as this great thing is, or has been heard like it. What great thing? Well, he emphasizes two elements. Number one, did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and lived? Number two, or has God essayed to come and take him a nation from the midst of another nation? By trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by strong hand and by outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that God your Lord, God, Tetragrammaton, did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And it's all ultimately shown to you that you might know that God, God, the Tetragrammaton, the holy name, he is God. He's the only one. There is none else beside him. And that's precisely the point. You go back all the way to creation, verse 32. That was the ultimate discontinuity because there was nothing that came before. Obviously, that wasn't God within the system because that was God creating the system. Well, in precisely the same vein, when you read of the Revelation and you read of the Exodus, you are reading of a complete negation of the system. God dramatically manifest. God revealed so everyone will know that more than anything else is critical. That is the message as expressed by way of culmination in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. Know this day and consider it in your heart that God, God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath there is none else that's critical that's exactly what it's all about and of course one can't help but note here this is precisely the salient feature in moses's mission this is the message of the exodus
if you ask, well, why didn't God reveal this modality to the patriarchs? It wasn't a question of the name. They knew the holy name. They knew the Tetragrammaton, as we already saw. Why did he reveal this modality of negating the system to them? There are, of course, a number of alternatives, but probably the most plausible is he didn't reveal it to them because they didn't need it. They didn't need miracles negating the system in order to have complete, perfect, unswerving faith in him. Miracles would have been completely superfluous. Indeed, if they would have encountered in their lives nothing but distress and misery, their perfect faith in God would not have been damaged in the least. So that any negation of the system was totally superfluous. What changed in the time of Moses? What changed is, first and foremost, there's a nation. A nation is not going to be able to function at that uniform level of such stratospheric faithfulness toward God. So for the nation, as a nation, there needs to be the clarity of establishing the system itself is completely subordinate to God and God negates the entire system that needs to come into the world so that from then on, when you see God operating in the system, you'll know enough to identify God's hand as the hand of the one who, whenever he so deems, completely negates the system. But of course, there's an additional dimension. It's not just a matter of the need to establish this modality for the sake of Israel. It's also the role of the Exodus and indeed the role of Israel for the world. The recurrent theme in the Exodus, after all, is precisely this. Remember, in Exodus chapter 7, the point of the plagues, verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am God. I am God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. That's a general introduction. When we consider the thrust of plague number one, in verse 17, thus says God, in this you will know that I am God, that I am God, Tetragrammaton. I will smite with the staff that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. In chapter 8, again, we continue to see the list of lessons. The withdrawal of the plague of frogs is, verse 6, that you may know that there is none like unto God, the Tetragrammaton. In the warning regarding the fourth plague, the plague of the noxious creatures, the wild beasts, once again, the separation between the land of Goshen and the rest of Egypt is to the end that you may know that I am God, the Tetragrammaton, the holy name in the midst of the earth. Likewise, continuing in this progression, after the first six plagues, we read in Exodus chapter 9, in verse 14, the role of the plagues, in particular, of course, of hail here, is that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. And in verse 16, that my name will be declared throughout all the earth. And what is that name? God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, negating the system, creator, the author of the world, and of the Exodus. In verse 29, 
when the plague of hail is withdrawn, it is that you may know that the earth is God's. And again, it's with the Tetragrammaton. And finally, in Exodus chapter 10, in verse 2, and this is the whole purpose of the story, you may know that I am God. I am God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. A lesson to Israel, ultimately, a lesson to all the world. Everyone needs to learn that. And in particular at this moment, why is this modality being revealed? Why this transformation? Because God is establishing a mechanism, ultimately, to illuminate all the world. We've seen it before, but it's appropriate to see it again. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6. I, God, Tetragrammaton, have called you in righteousness and have taken hold of your hand and kept you and set you for covenant of the people, for a light of the nations. There's a whole world that needs to be illuminated out there. And moreover, in Isaiah chapter 49, after stating that the object of these words is Israel in whom I will be glorified, in verse 6, once again, I will also give you for a light of the nations that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. Because that's the goal. That God's salvation won't just reach Israel, but will reach to the end of the earth. And so, in that light, we read in Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of God, of God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, is shown upon you. And indeed, in verse 2, darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the peoples, but upon you, God will shine, and his glory will be seen upon you. To what end? So only you will have the light? No. Verse 3, with which we conclude, and nations will walk at your light, and kings at the brightness of your shining. God reveals himself, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton, to transform not just Israel, but the whole world. And returning then to the note upon which we began, again, Moses' complaint. Why did you send me? What's the purpose of this mission? Things are just getting worse. Things are getting worse in a natural context. And as long as we are shackled to nature, even when we appreciate that God controls nature, even when we appreciate that God plunders nature, but we think we are only perceiving God's hand through nature, we're not really getting the message. That ultimately, the message that there is none other than God is what emerges once you realize, I am God even to the patriarchs. I appeared only as God Almighty. They didn't need anything more than that. But you do. The nation does. The world does. There is a transformation. God manifests not only through nature. God manifests as creator ex nihilo. God manifests as the God of Revelation. God manifests as negating the system. To them, I didn't reveal that. To you, I am. And therefore, your mission is number one, verse six. Say unto the people of Israel, I am God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. And indeed, that way you will know that I am God, verse seven, the Tetragrammaton. The ultimate message, I am God. At the end of the whole progression of the Exodus, it's not just for you.
Because in the end, indeed, once you've gotten this message, once you are summoned to be light of the nations, nations will walk at your light and kings at the brightness of your shining. And this transformation will be a transformation of all the world. So that through the Exodus, we learn about God on a level that we haven't before. Through the Exodus, we are all transformed. And it's not just Israel. Certainly it's everyone who believes in the Exodus, who believes in the God of the Exodus, who believes in the God of the Bible. And ultimately, it is a message that will engulf the entire world. This was the first note of the transformation. But we know, ultimately, that transformation will transform everyone. God bless you.